raise your hand. <laughs> you know, I always like before I start talking in any group, because I don't know who's here and why they're here. But before I get started anywhere, the first and foremost thing that should be on our mind is the fact that we want to share God's beautiful, glorious message of the gospel. And the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. When a person puts his faith and his, just his, his trust or believes that gospel, God saves them for eternity. That's good news. Amen. That's good news. And I try not to go too far before I mention that because if I say a whole lot of different things and tell you about all the dynamics of justification, but don't offer that one person that might be out there the opportunity to trust in that finished work so that they can experience this justification that we're talking about, I missed a great opportunity. And I don't think God would be pleased with that. So I definitely want to share that with each and every one of us that are here today. I always like to uh, shout out my brother Fred Beckmeyer. Fred is the reason I'm here today. Let me just give you a real brief story. I know we got like an hour and a half, so. <laughs> this brief story about uh, Fred and I generally like to say, especially since Fred is here, not to try to put you on the spot, Fred, but this is why how important this thing is and how, how God works it out. I was in Buffalo, New York. I was in a traditional uh, Baptist church. You know, the doctrine wasn't correct, but I was reading my Bible and just not understanding how Paul was saying we justified by faith alone, and James was saying it was faith plus works. And nobody can answer that question. One day, a buddy of mine who was a Baptist, he was a deacon, actually, he was going to church. We had a radio ministry. We were just teaching all kind of crazy stuff. Well, he didn't have no sound. We were just teaching, 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 right? Just teaching. I, you know, I was trying to say it was by Jesus Christ, but I didn't really have the inner workings of it. Well, he goes to a barbershop. They have a track there by a guy, and uh, on, the, on the track, it just happened to have a gentleman's name, Fred Beckmeyer. And his number, his number is, in, is out of state. Back then, I don't know if we even, sell, you know, cell phones you can dial for free. But, I, you know, I probably have to go to a pay phone or something to dial. And then I don't know what it was. But anyway, I called Fred. Now, I don't know if either I left a message for him to call me back or he answered him. Either way, he got back in touch with me. And I started, you know, discussing these different dynamics. Of, well, is the faith alone? Is the faith alone? It seems like this guy in this track, really, he has, he's on to something. But I still don't understand a few things. And Fred took his time and gently walked me through the process of what it took to be saved and, and understanding those dynamics. And just it just really caused me to grow to a greater understanding. And I always have to just let him know that's how simple it is. So don't never think it's just that one little thing that you might be able to share with somebody might just be the uh, gospel presentation that might save them for eternity. So always realize that that's definitely, definitely important. Our time is short, so I want to get to the word of God. I, I trust that my brothers pray already, so... We're definitely going to realize uh, that the time is short, and we're going to try to get to the Word of God immediately. Turn to Romans. Now, it's a lot to talk about with justification. And I'm a little at a disadvantage because I don't know if some of you may watch me on YouTube or see me. I usually use a board. And the board just really kind of keeps me focused. But without it, I still think God is able because it's really the Word. <laughs> I believe God is able. So it's, it's the word. So we're going to trust that the word will be able to be conveyed in spite of the fact that I don't have the comfort of my chalkboard. It's almost like a blanket for me. <laughs> Amen. So uh, let's look at this uh, one passage of scripture. We're going to start it with one. We're going to go to very many different passages as we discuss this topic of justification. Romans, the third chapter. Romans, the third chapter. We'll start here. In the 30th verse. Romans 3 and 30. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. We're going to start there because I know a lot of times when we're talking about the topic of justification and Christendom alone, the topic becomes very confusing because individuals don't know the difference between justification by faith and justification through faith. Now, the word of God clearly states what God is doing, what God has done as it pertains to justification. It says, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. That is the same, that's, that's a faith that is being demonstrated or manifested in two different ways. Now, we want to look at this because it's important for you to understand it when you begin to share this gospel with other individuals. You need to know this. There's some things that are essential for us to really know. And the, the difference here, see, when Paul writes the book of Romans, it's really the edification. It's, it's the edifice of our doctrine. It's a building block. Christ is the foundation. And then he begins to build on top of the foundation, which is Christ. And justification is that main 
the, 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 almost the groundwork of that um, foundation. And we really have to have that straight because if we don't have justification straight, everything that we build upon that won't be structurally sound. You see what he's saying? So you really have to have justification right. So what I want to deal with very briefly here is how God justified individuals in time past. And he said the circumcision. Now look at uh, Deuteronomy. I'm going to try to use some very familiar passages for some of us. And if, you, if, if, if this is new to you, definitely make notes and jot these things down. Because some of the things I'm saying I'll probably repeat quite a bit. But I definitely want you to see a certain, uh, some of these things. We're going to make a contrast. And for time's sake, I'm going to be moving right along. But Deuteronomy 6 and verse 25, look what it says here. And it shall be our righteousness. In fact, I'll start at verse 24, Deuteronomy 6, verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord, our God, for, uh, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day, this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do what? All these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So there was a standing of righteousness that was, could be achieved by Israel if they observed to what? Do. If they observed to do. And what Christianity has done today, they still, because they don't understand the rightly dividing word of truth, they still believe that righteousness is something that you have to and this is what we want to definitely be able to rightly divide and show them now. That was in time past when this is being manifested, how God revealed how, uh, and how he could make that when the law was given to Israel, how they could be righteous if they did the law, if they actually performed the particular law there. And then let's go a little further. In this time sake, I'm really running. This is just something I added on here because I want you to see the contrast here. Go to uh, Mark 10. Because a lot of individuals think the New Testament starts here, but they so they might say, yeah, that was the Old Testament. That was the Old Testament. That was how ju individuals were justified in the Old Testament. But I'm going to go with, but you, this, I'm going to go by what Jesus say, right? You ever heard him say that? I'm going to go by what Jesus say. So if, since Jesus said, and if, it, if you have the right Bible, they say the letters should be in red. You ever heard him say that? So if, G if they're in red letters, it really is important because Jesus said it. So a lot of individuals get into that type of a spiel when they look at what Jesus said. Well, if you go over here, some people believe this is where our information begins because this is where Jesus Christ was actually right here on earth. And now that's a great mistake, but some individuals believe it. And we have to have the ability within ourselves to show them why this is not true. An individual, a, a, a individual comes up to Jesus and he says, I'll start at verse, uh, in Mark 10, verse 17. And when he was, when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, talking about Jesus, and asked him, good master, what shall I do to do what? See, he's talking about inheriting eternal life. Don't let individuals tell you that that form of justification is not salvation that leads to eternal life. Because what we're going to demonstrate to you and show you is that what was happening in time past, what's happening here is what Jesus Christ told him of what he needed to do in order to receive eternal life, thus be justified and made right in his sight. Jesus Christ has given him the information that he needs to abide by in order to get that right standing before God. Look what he says here. And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. He says, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. What does he tell him to do? Keep the law. So in other words, if he wanted to get that standing, there was again the same dynamic that we've seen in Deuteronomy. There was things that he needed to do. Now, the individual goes on, he says, and he answered and said unto, the, um, unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding uh, him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. It's still something else. And then Jesus Christ told him the dynamic of what he needed to do at that particular time dispensationally in order to still obtain that righteous standing or that eternal life that he was talking about. So he tells him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up thy cross and follow me. Question, is that what we do today for salvation? Wait a minute, but this is Jesus talking. <laughs> 
But this is Jesus talking. And some people would have you to believe because this is Jesus. But the Bible lets us know that we know Jesus no more after the flesh. This is Jesus Christ after the flesh. This is Jesus Christ under the economy called the law. And we don't direct people to that for them to be justified today. You have to know the difference. A lot of times we miss opportunities to share God's word and the the gospel with individuals because we don't look at the dynamics and the details of what God has done in time past versus what God is doing today in the body of Christ. You want to be able to correct them. And you correct them in love. You're not browbeating them and trying to act like you know more Bible than them and that. But you're really, by the grace of God, are ex- d- demonstrating the love of Christ to them by telling them simply, no, this is Jesus Christ under the, un- you know, he says, uh, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They weren't even going to Gentiles here. The Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. And you want to really comp- share that compassionately with them. So we just dealt with here. Deuteronomy, then you're talking about the Gospels here. Now we're going to jump over here. Well, not here, actually, but we're going to jump over here as it pertains to the Word of God, Hebrews through uh, Revelation, and show what justification is here. Because we're talking about justification here by faith. Look, look over at James, because this is where you're going to have a problem. This is why I wanted to add this in. This is something that I believe, because I really have a totally different. This is just an introduction. I'll use the last hour for, for the brother <laughs> message. But this is just something that you're going to you're going to run into this because in Christendom, because they don't rightly under uh, rightly divide the word of truth. There are some things that you need to know in order to not set them straight like you. But you want to place you want to put them in a position where they can receive the word of God unto salvation. That's and you have to do it in love. We get we come together. See, we we try to make this like a classroom. I love the tables and because we're taking notes. We're trying to get this understanding so that I can be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind has to change. I'm trying to empty out all that old Leroy and all that old religion that I used to have so that I can put on sound doctrine so that I can be a benefit to somebody because it's not me, but it's Christ living. When I put the word in me, I put Christ in me. Christ is what makes the difference. I have to, I, I die daily. And I really have to develop who Christ is in my life in order to be a benefit to anybody. Because it's the only thing that makes a difference. Look at James 2, 21. I'm trying to be abbreviated here, just read just a couple of areas. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had did what? Offered his son Isaac. See, there's a work being done. Faith plus works. That's what by faith is. God tells an individual what he needs to do. And the individual has to find himself doing it or he's not in faith. He that believeth. He that believeth and. Is baptized. You remember that? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What if he just believed back there in Mark? Would he be saved? He had to believe and do the work of baptism in order for God to honor him or to make him righteous or to justify him before him because there was something that God told him to do that was for the obedience of that faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing cometh by the word of God. At whatever time you're living it dispensationally, whatever God's word says to you in order to be justified, that's what you need to be doing. James 2. Seest thou how... Faith wrought with his works, and by works his faith was made perfect. This is James observing Abraham. Now, you have to know that James observes the justification of Abraham, that justification unto salvation before God. This is by faith. This is that God, that same God, seeing there's one God that will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision how? Through faith, we're going to get into that. We haven't discussed it, but this is the contrast. By faith means that God gave them a word that they had to do something in addition to believe in order to stand in that righteous standing before God, in order to be justified. In this case, he's citing that Abraham offered Isaac. He'd offered. If he wouldn't have offered Isaac, guess what? As it pertains to this justification, he wouldn't have been justified. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, um, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and what? Everybody put that on you? Are you grace teachers and believers out there? Anybody put that one on you? 
They had Bible ready for you, didn't they? See, the Bible I read, see, the Bible I read says that it's faith plus works. They get it real de- de- uh, demonstrative with you. It's faith <laughs> plus works <laughs> that save a man. See, if you see, all faith is saying that you have to put feet to your faith. And you don't hear, he's heard it. See, they saying that in order for you to have faith, you have to do something. If you don't, if you're not doing anything, you really don't have faith. If you, but if you really, really have faith, I'm going to see your faith is going to be demonstrated by your actions because I'm going to see you doing right. You're not. You're going to walk different. You're going to talk real different. You're going to go to different places. You're going. It, it, you're going to have some different. It's going to be something different about you if I see you. They convinced me of that. <laughs> they convinced me. If I if I really was saved, I, it was got to be something different about me. So I used to walk a little straighter. <laughs> Huh? That's different, right? I used to walk like this. But I'm different now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because they wanted, they wanted to see some external difference about you because it was faith plus works. And I, I make a joke out of that because you have to have a diff- you have to have an understanding that there is a contrast between what justification was. In time past, what justification is now and what justification will be even in the future. This chart, some people say we worship this chart. (laughs) This chart simply is defining or illustrating to us how the Bible is laid out. That's all it is. I see when I when I seen Pastor Jordan going all over that board and just jotting here and jotting here. And he was laying out, he was putting a framework to how the Bible was presented. It gave us a panoramic view of what God did in time past, what God is doing now, and what God will do in ages to come. And if you're going to be an effective minister of reconciliation, you need to have a working knowledge, a working understanding of how to illustrate that to individuals when you teach God's word to them. You need to know it if you're going to be effectual. Not name only, but you're going to be effective. You're going to accomplish the desired result that God wants to accomplish. You need to know it for yourself. Your Christian life cannot function on the basis of ignorance. Mm, there you go. I came up with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know <laughs> But it's the truth. <laughs> but it's the truth. Your, your Christian life cannot function on the basis. So let's get that. So you see. Through faith, what through faith is. Let's go to Romans. Because now we're going to talk, I mean, but what by faith is. Now let's go to Romans. I'm going to use this last hour to discuss these things. <laughs> Romans 5, because it really gets right to it. <clears throat> Romans 5. I hope I have time to get through some of these things here. Romans 5. We're going to start at verses uh, 17, 18, and 19, okay? Romans 5, verse 17, 18, and 19. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall receive, I mean, shall reign in life by who? By one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men unto, I mean, all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Verse 19 this is the last thing we'll read here. For as by one man's disobedience, we were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous amen so now this god is really this is the demonstration of really what through faith is now we're going to begin to go into the dynamics of what through faith is because through faith is what you and i have already experienced and it's important that we know we've experienced because when we talk about things that are of god like this you don't feel them smell them or taste them they're not in your sensory realm you only you only receive them by faith we walk by faith not by so they're true about us because god's word says it and again 
That's why our Christian life cannot function on the basis of ignorance because there's some, some things that are true about you that if you don't get into the word of God and find out for yourself, you won't, they still be true about you, but you won't walk in the power, more, power of it. You, you, you see, you won't walk in that truth. You won't walk in the, the peace that it brings. You won't walk in the joy that it brings. That's how you can keep that level of joy. You can keep that level of peace because you have the truth within you of what God has done on our behalf. So these things are definitely true. Now, look what it says here. Very, very important information. Verse 18. Therefore, as therefore, as by the offense, one of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Who was the who, who made the offense? Adam, I still, praise God, the choir sung that. That was beautiful. (laughs) Because the offense of one, and this is where we want to take people to, because you see how we talked about time past. We talked about when God gave the law to Israel. We talked about Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry. Then we jumped over here. Now we're back here at Adam. This is where the offense was, back here at Adam. There's something you want to understand here. When God deals with the body of Christ, as it pertains to our righteousness that he's given us, he reflects it all the way back to Adam. He bypasses everything that happened in Israel's program, and he jumps back to Adam. Because that's where the offense was. And this is where we want to really talk to individuals at, because sometimes if you begin to conversate with people, they want to take you back to Israel's program to try to see why and how God established righteousness in time past and confuse you as to what God is doing today as it pertains to making individuals righteous. You see, they want to get you caught up in here and tangled up in here. But God goes back to here to tell you this is why you're wrong. You being wrong has nothing to do with this. You see, you you being wrong has nothing to do with uh, this area of scripture in here. You being wrong has to do with Adam. The offense of one. And you want to keep it that simple because he uses that same illustration to see to show you how you'll be made righteous. That's good news here. Therefore, by by the offense of one judgment, this is why we're in the situation and this is why we need justification. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness. This is what happens here of one whose righteousness. This is something we want to always remember. It's never our righteousness. It's always his righteousness. You get this? Now, see, this is important because there's going to come up a term, I mean, a phrase later that is a packaging of Jesus Christ's righteousness along with some other things. Look what we see here. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, this is another thing here. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, who is the one man? Adam, see, that's what we're taking them back to. That's what we want to. This is what we want to illustrate. Many were made sinners. Why were we made sinners? We were made sinners because of the disobedience of Adam. That's what happened to us. The reason you are a sinner before God is because of the disobedience of Adam. I know you do some things when you see some things. You've done things in the past before you saved, and you thought that's why, because that's what this taught us, that it was the things we were doing that was making us bad and not right before God. But what God is telling us, look, I got, I got, I'm going to show you exactly what's going on here. The reason you're a sinner and the reason you're not right in, the sight, in my sight is because of what Adam did. And you're a procreation of Adam, so therefore you're just a manifestation of that same fall. That's who you are. That's who you are. So the word of God is very clear here. But look at the answer here. For as by one man's disobedience, verse 19, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, what? Shall many be made righteous. Now, this is the contrast here. This is the two different things here. Jesus Christ's righteousness and Jesus Christ's obedience has been given to you and us. See, a lot of people don't talk about this. Jesus Christ's righteousness, Jesus Christ's obedience have been given to you and I, and it's been packaged. And he gave us his life. Turn back to Romans 4. Romans 3. Romans 3. Because we want to look at this righteousness. We want to start right where it starts at. 
right where it starts at. Romans 3.21. But now, now, this is a big deal here. The word of God is revealing a, set, a righteousness now that is not the righteousness that is of time past. It says, but now. Now there's a righteousness that God is revealing, but now the righteousness of God without the law. You see this law here? God is revealing a righteousness today in the earth that is without the law. That's why it has nothing to do with this area here. He's revealing a righteousness in that area there that is without the law. Look what he goes on to say. But now the righteousness of God that is without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now look what he says here. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, And upon all them that do what? You can't take that out. For there is no difference. The righteousness of God today in the earth is by the faith of Jesus Christ. We're going to get into that in a moment. But this is another area I want to share with you here. It's unto all. And my brother Tom Bruchet wrote an excellent book, uh, The Dictionary of Our Gospel. And we try to term some of these uh, terms here. He wrote an excellent book as it makes a reference to this, it talks about unto all is what we refer to as a unlimited provision. You ever heard that? It's an unlimited, it's unto all. God has enough righteousness for everybody. It's unto all. But this is where a lot of individuals kind of drop the ball at here. It says, and upon all them that do what? So now it's unto all. There's an unlimited provision of God's righteousness But there is a limited application of that righteousness. And there's a prerequisite an individual has to believe. In order for you to be a beneficiary of this righteousness of God, there's one thing you need to do. You need to believe that gospel that we talked about a moment ago. You need to believe that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. And the moment you believe that, this becomes true about you. You receive the righteousness of God, the life of Christ, and the obedience of Christ, and it's packaged in something called the faith of Christ. God's right, God's righteousness through Jesus Christ, God's obedience through Jesus Christ, and the life of Christ is a package deal that he gives you in its phrase, the faith of Christ. Don't let anybody take the faith of Christ away from you because therein lies your justification. You are just, you are made right before God, not by any works of your own, not by your own faith. Not by your faith in Christ, but it's by the faith of Christ because it's how God has substituted your sinfulness for Jesus Christ's righteousness. We're going to go just a little further there, but let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5 very briefly here. Very brief. We want to show this. We're going to get back to that, but we're going to show this 2 Corinthians 5. The faith of Christ. I definitely want to deal with that for a moment. But we're going to deal with, show this very briefly here, how God made this change here. 2 Corinthians 5.21. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.21. Look what it says here. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God to him. Now, look what God did. God the Father took him who knew no sin. Who was that? Jesus Christ. Now, this is the term that we want to check off our list, imputation. God the Father imputed the sins of the world to Jesus Christ. That means he charged Jesus Christ with that sin. He put that sin upon Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ just didn't receive the sin. He paid the penalty and the punishment for our sins. And guess what? He didn't practice sin. He didn't do any sin. But God the Father placed the sin of you and I on Jesus Christ through the process of what we call imputation. He imputed that sin to Jesus Christ. He took our judgment. He took our condemnation. And he paid the price for it. You have to get that. See, this is an important thing because this is what we want to use when individuals don't truly understand how they're justified. This is what you want to take them back to because this is the the simplicity of it. 
The same way God the Father put sin on Jesus Christ, charged him with sin without him performing or practicing sin, is the same way he gives you righteousness without you performing or practicing it. Don't think you're performing or practicing righteousness today. The righteousness that you have received of God is because God imputed the faith of Christ, the righteousness and the obedience of Jesus Christ. He gave it to you as a free gift. And when God sees you, he sees you in the, in the obedience of Christ. He sees you in the righteousness of Christ. And he sees you living the life of Christ. Amen. Galatians 2 and 20 says, for I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live it by the faith of the son of God. The faith of the life. The, see, the practical living that you're doing is by the faith of the Son. It's not your life. You're dead and your life is hid in Christ, in God. So if you're doing anything to the glory of God, it's because you're studying to show yourself approved, putting on the mind of Christ and responding to this world the way Christ would respond to it. In sound doctrine. Not back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's look at how important the faith of Christ is. Now, I've abridged this. I've cut through a lot of notes just because I think this portion is very important. The faith of Christ. Turn to Galatians 2 and, 12, uh, 2 and 16. Well, I got 35 minutes. Somebody, is my timer here? That timer can't be right. Uh, that timer can't be right. Galatians 2. 16. Now look at this. Galatians 2.16. We're talking about being justified, right? Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by how? You have to get this, but by the faith. You're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Knowing that a man is not justified by the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now look at the contrast here. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. When did, what did we do to believe in Jesus Christ? What's that one thing we did? What did we do? We, we just believed the gospel. We believed the finished work that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. When you're talking about your believing in Jesus Christ, that's the one thing you did to believe. Now, I'll save that. But that's that one thing that you did to believe. It's very important that you realize that because that's what God looks at, that little minute thing that you does. And the moment you do that, God gives you the faith of his son. See, your life would, your faith would not endure. I wish you could have had time, chance to show you how God declared Abraham righteous and said he was strong in faith. But when you look at it, it doesn't look like Abraham was strong in faith. <laughs> He doubted God. He laughed at God. He tried his, his way. But God, the, when you look at Romans 4, it said he was strong in faith and he didn't stagger at the promises of God. And he was like, because God wasn't looking at his faith. God was looking at his own faithfulness. Oh, I hope you get this. But what we want to share is that this now, this is all right. This is important. Look, look what we're looking at here. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Now, this is the big substitute here. He takes our little little belief that we, we, we put before him, and then he gives us this big mass of work, the operation of God, the faith of Christ. He gives that to us that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, I want to share something with you. You know what? I'm going to give you another verse here. I'm going to give you another verse first. Galatians 3.22. We're going to build this up a little bit. Galatians 3.22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that. How do you receive the promise of by faith of Jesus Christ? How do you receive that faith of Jesus Christ? You have to believe it's not given to you just absolutely free. There's some individuals out there that uh, universal reconciliation, universal salvation. They accept. They say that everybody is saved. The problem is that they don't recognize that there is something that is needed to be done. And that one thing that God requires of us that is not a work is that we believe. It's the only thing you can do without doing anything. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith. 
Not your faith. His faith Amen. is counted for righteousness. You have to get that. I'm giving you a lot in a little, but then here we go. We have to keep moving. So we talk about that. That's the faith of Christ there. Look at Philippians 3 and 9. Philippians 3 and 9. We're getting somewhere. I'm just taking you to the paces. I'm going to show you, show you something that's vitally important. We're going to throw a curveball here at the end a little bit. <laughs> throw a little curve right here. 3 and 9. Philippians 3 and 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. So in the, when an individual is out there trying to do the law and say that they're right because they're doing the law, whose righteousness is that? Their own righteousness. Does God accept their own righteousness? <coughs> What is their own righteousness before God? It's filthy rags. Paul knows that. And be, found in my own, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. How important is the faith of Christ? It's very important, is it? Do you realize if you take the faith of Christ out of the gospel of our salvation, you are in big trouble. In fact, our, our, it, it all falls apart because the basis of us being justified is because of his faithfulness and of his obedience and his righteousness that is granted to you and I, right? <laughs> Through technology, I could I snunk a, a different version of the Bible in here. <laughs> I hope nobody else has one, but just in case you do, we're going to just pull up a few of these verses, okay? We're going to look at the same verses we just read in Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16, right? You remember what it says? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You see that faith of Christ, right? This is a different version of the Bible. I read seven different versions and all of them said it like this. Watch it. Yet, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believed on Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Is that saying the same thing? What did it take out? When it takes the faith of Christ out of the equation, I'm not justified and neither are you. You're not justified by your faith in Christ. What justifies you before the father is the faith of his son. Listen, God doesn't want anything from you. He really doesn't. And if you look at Romans 7, he talked about he talked about no more I. And then he goes and talks about yet not I. He's talking about how he's totally disassociated you from sin and how he's totally associated you with the life of Christ. And anything that you do now, you're doing it in the name of Christ. One more verse. I got about 20 minutes. I know I, I, know I don't. I, I'm just joking. Here. They say, wait a minute. We got to move on. We told you last night. Just one more. But I just want to show you how important this is here. Galatians 3.22. Galatians 3.22. And I'm going to conclude here. Uh, I got a lot to say, but a little bit of time. Here we go. I got a few minutes. Look like, okay. But the scripture have, uh, Galatians 3.22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Slow down to reading the wrong version. Okay. Here we go. But the scripture shut up all things under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. When you understand sound doctrine, you understand that faith in Jesus Christ is not the same. Your faith in Jesus Christ is what you exhibited to receive the faith of Christ. Because your faith alone wouldn't cut it. 
It was only the faith of his son that provided the righteousness for you. And when you take the faith of Christ out of the equation, it's almost somebody trying to put a dirty trick on you. We have to have the right Bible today. Now, listen, I, I have some clever individuals, I mean, not clever, but some spiritual brothers out here that can really work themselves through and show you some other way. But you know the reason what convinced me that I was going to stick with King James only? And I know that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about justification, but you know your justification is only found in King James Version. And when I'm not praising King James, I'm, pra- I'm, I'm, I'm praising the preservation of God. God preserved his method of salvation unto you and I today, and it is found in the King James Version. I'm not preaching King James, but that's where, if you find it somewhere else, show me the version. But when they take the faith of Christ out of the equation, our salvation, this is the foundation of everything. It's our justification. Do you know it's our justification that assures our salvation? Our salvation is assured the moment we trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and justification. Look over here, 820, Romans 820. You're talking about eternal security. Look at uh, uh, Romans 820, I believe. I got excited and lost my place here. Now, 830, yeah, 830. Let me know where I was at here. Romans 8.30, look what it says here. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, what did he do? So if you're justified, guess what else God is going to do for you? What's going to stop him from doing it? Can anything stop God from doing that? That means that he justifies you, he makes you right. He's going to see you to the end. Let's look at the verse that proves that, Philippians. Philippians 1. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, where did he begin the work? The moment you believe, what do you receive? Justification, right? He began that work at you at justification. Look what he says here. Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's to, that's to your glorification. He's going to perform it until the day of Christ. And I believe my last verse here, Ephesians. I'll close in Ephesians here. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You see that? This is the gospel being preached. And, and then what our response to that gospel is that we trusted it. In whom also after that you believed that you can't take belief out. That's the key article for us. That's how we attach ourselves to what God has done for us through belief. After that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until future aid time to come, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of what? That's until glorification. God seals it. It's a done deal. We're trying to get people justified today. We want them to be just and made right before God. And the simple, unique message that God has given us to do that is to preach the gospel. The fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. When a person places their belief in that, God justifies them, and he assures that he will glorify them as well. To God be the glory. Well, that's better than saying, boo. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Leroy. I, I, and I made the comment about the gloves. <laughs> and then uh, Edward's mirror, and then Leroy showed you the walk. <laughs> How to put feet to it. See, so you're, get, you're getting a real education this morning. <laughs> and,
Leroy's is the only one I recommend. <laughs> the glove routine, forget. <laughs> and uh, the, the mirror, well, you don't want to scare yourself. But getting a good walk is a good thing. Oh, praise the Lord. Thanks, Leroy. And uh, it is important. You know, that's basic information that you ought to tell yourself every day. You know, really is. You ought to preach the gospel to yourself every day. That's why Paul wrote Romans, to do that. All right, we're going to take a break. Be back in here in about six minutes, and we'll get ourselves done for the last meeting this morning. You got just a minute to break. <laughs> Leroy, would you give that mic to Russ? <laughs> 